<laughs> okay, well, hello, everybody, and welcome to today's RettSyndrome.org Ret Ed webcast, IEP Strategies for Inclusion with RettSyndrome.org's good friends, Mickey McCool and Katie Bush. This is Paige Nuez, Director of Family Empowerment at RettSyndrome.org, and I will be your moderator today. Our board of directors and all of us at RettSyndrome.org want to personally thank you for your support and engagement. Rett Syndrome is a rare disorder, and as such, continuous awareness, empowerment, and research is everything. I say that as, sorry, okay, and I say that as mom to a beautiful 16-year-old teenager with Rett Syndrome and as your representative at RettSyndrome.org. Education, connectivity, and advocacy are the necessary ties that bind us together. While investing in research towards granting the ultimate wish of a cure leads us at RettSyndrome.org to focus a lot of time and energy in this arena, we remain steadfast in our concern with the health and well-being of our children today, and therefore we're so pleased to bring you today's presentation. With Rett Syndrome being a childhood onset disorder with a prognosis of living well into adulthood, all of us have a very deep and long relationship to our loved ones with Rett Syndrome, and inclusive relationships are paramount to your child's health and well-being and for yours. Today, we'll explore this in more depth. Before we begin, though, I'd like to share some brief tech points on how GoToWebinar operates if this is your first time joining us. The audio feed is open to our presenters only, so you don't have to worry about your background noise interfering with the presentation. If you look to the upper right corner of your screen, you'll see a control panel window. We invite you to type your questions or comments in the question field throughout the presentation, and we will answer these at the end of the slide presentation as well as any questions pre-submitted um, at the time that you registered. If we don't get to your question today, we will work with Mickey and Katie to get all writing questions answered and posted in a QA document to our Red Ed webpage once completed. If the control panel window is distracting to you, you can minimize or move the window, then you can expand it at any time if you wish to submit a question. Now, next point, this is really important. The session is being recorded, and we will post a link of the recording along with a QA document if needed to the Red Ed webpage so you can listen again or share this recording with others so they can take advantage of the information learned today. If you're having trouble hearing, please check and turn up the volume on your phone or device. With this, I'd like to turn our thoughts toward our topic for today on strategies for achieving, achieving true inclusion and fostering friendships. We'll talk about the formal IEP process through the eyes of a trained advocate and ret parent, and you'll hear examples of how the IEP goals for inclusion are actually applied and practiced and achieved from a real-life paraprofessional once you, the parent, is not there on campus. Our message today is this. Your child's education and inclusion are not experiments for the school to test out, Individualized education and inclusion are required to enable her best learning life to be nurtured through the support of educators. And a lot of this work begins with you setting this expectation and you feeling empowered to speak up as the need for adjustments, corrections, and room for growth appear over time because life is ever changing and evolving and so is your child. If today's session leaves you wanting more structured information about the actual IEP process and federally secured rights, you can refer back to our webcast recording, IEP Strategies for Success, that was done by Val Owens. And if you wish to explore practical strategies for fostering communication between your child, school staff, and typical peers and friends in her life, you can refer back to our webcast recording, Communication, Making It Count with Judy the Riviere. You can find both of those recordings on RettSyndrome.org. So now, continuing to build on these principles that you have a vibrant child who can learn and can have meaningful relationships, we bring you today Mickey McCool, parent and trained advocate, and Katie Bush, paraprofessional, to explore strategies for successful inclusion. Mickey and Katie, are you ready for me to turn control over to your screen? Yes. Great. Good. Okay. okay. So. <clears throat> Hello, everyone, and thanks for attending. I am Mickey McCool. I'm 57 years old. 
Um, I've been married to Dave, my husband, for 26 years, and we have two children. Ellie is 21, and she has Rett syndrome, and Bryce is 17, and he does not have Rett syndrome, and there we are. And I snuck a picture of Katie in there, too. She got to join us for a, a Christmas gathering, and it was a real blessing. So Ellie was born in 1997. She seemed typical for almost a year, and then as it happens with so many, there was a sudden and dramatic change, and she began losing skills left and right. And we knew something hit Ellie, but we didn't know what it was until she was nearly four years old. Um, and, and she was diagnosed with Rett syndrome in February of 2001, just over a year after the gene for Rett syndrome was discovered. So. Ellie began pre-kindergarten long before she received her diagnosis of Rett syndrome. She was in a self-contained classroom. There were five kids total in this classroom, and all five of them had very significant disabilities. There was one teacher, one classroom teacher's assistant, and then this parade of therapists who were in and out all day long. So there was always at least one therapist in there, PT, OT, speech, developmental, music, um, all kinds of therapists. We considered it uh, then a great choice, and we still consider it now. I would not do anything any differently a great choice. The teacher was fantastic and nurturing, and the program was very rich in early therapeutic interventions. The school itself that she was in was a state-funded school for early childhood special education. However, about half of the population of the school were typically developing kids. So really, there were only two self-contained classrooms in this whole school, and Ellie was in one of them. Okay, so uh, during the time at this school, but before Ellie received her diagnosis, for Red Syndrome, I was accepted into a program called Missouri Partners in Policy Making. And it was an intensive nine months long advocacy training. And it hit every topic and really taught in great detail on every topic from early childhood, uh, IEPs, state and federal uh, legislation advocacy uh, in the early years and the later years, what are the available re funding resources in my state uh, and how they're funded in adult life and everything you can imagine, Medicaid, Medicare. Um, so it, that program is available, I think in over 30 states right now. So I would say it, it would be a great, Thing for you to search the internet and see if it's available in your state. Just you can Google partners in policymaking in the name of your state. This program was the thrust behind my passion for inclusion. So why, it, why is inclusion important? So if any of you have heard me speak before, you have most likely heard me talk about the need to belong. There has been extensive research done and on the need to belong and published research on the topic. The research that has been done has revealed that the need to belong is a basic human need. It ranks just barely below the need for food, water, and shelter. It's worth your while to also do a search on this research. Just to Google in uh, the need to belong and see what comes up and then take notes on what you find because that information can come in very handy uh, at IEPs down the road, particularly if you're dealing with an IEP team that does not value uh, the in inclusion. Well, so inclusion helps meet this basic need that we all have to belong. And I'd like you to remember that inclusion is not a place. It's not a regular ed classroom or a, a room where kids come in. It's not a program. It's a philosophy. It's a way of life. And it's a way of life that just like you want your, your son or daughter to generalize the skills that they learn across all environments, inclusion is the same way. It needs to be uh, generalized. It's founded on compassionate understanding. So kindergarten. By the time Ellie was ready to enter, enter kindergarten, our dreams for Ellie had changed. 
and we had decided to switch directions midstream. We'd been in this little self-contained therapeutic environment, and now we suddenly wanted her in regular education. So it was a trick to get the IEP team at the school on board with that. Um, our local public elementary school did not have a self-contained classroom. So the school that Ellie should be going to, where all the other kids in our neighborhood went, argued that Ellie should not even be in that school. Uh, they thought she should be at one five miles up the road where they could take care of children like Ellie. That's how they worded it. And we wanted Ellie to get the know, to know the children in her own neighborhood. So, I, you know, I could spend a great deal of time, and I actually wish I had a great deal of time, to share our challenges and successes along the way in these early years. But the condensed version is this. There was really powerful resistance by the school administration, not only to the idea of inclusion, but to entertaining any notion whatsoever that Ellie had a brain that could learn, um, a heart that desired friends, and a personality capable of offering friendship. My job as Ellie's mom and Dave's job as her dad was to help this team of people see differently to see Ellie differently and to see us differently. So today I'm gonna to offer you just a few strategies that worked for us um, and for other parents I've been privileged to assist. Uh, I have more strategies up my sleeve than I could cram into an hour or an hour and a half, but these are a few of the biggies I'm gonna to touch on. So just a couple of things for me to add here before I begin. Ellie was in a regular ed classroom about 15% of the time during kindergarten, barely. And by fifth grade, she was in the regular ed classroom 100% of the time. And that happened little by little by little. You need the patience of Job. And you can see here on these pictures, my favorite thing about the picture in the center is you have to really look for a minute to find Ellie. And that was her third grade uh, class. And uh, many of the these kids in these pictures are still friends with Ellie. So during middle school, Ellie needed and ac accessed the resource room a little bit. And in her high school years, she utilized the resource room and accessed it a little bit more. We also went from, um, from receiving letter grades to a, a pass fail in, in high school, which hopefully Katie will touch on that a little bit later. Um, so while, the, while access to the regular ed environment was important to us, our primary goal for Ellie was meaningful friendships and relationships. So our approach of saying, oh, Ellie has to be in the regular ed classroom, it was just one approach. And it was one means to an end. And the end is relationships, right? So that, that's your, your ultimate goal. Remember always that your son or daughter is capable of receiving and offering meaningful friendships. And the, this is Ellie, one, the bottom picture is her in middle school with many of those friends there you saw in the last pictures. And then the top one is her senior prom. And um, you can see that, well, you may not recognize them from when they were little, having looked at that picture only a second, but those are also many of the same friends that she had back then. So she still has the same core group of friends she had in grade school. And they visit her when they're home on break from college and they check in on her, and I really do believe they'll be connected for life. So moving on to strategies. The first strategy is you will love our daughter, right? Your first job, is to help your child's IEP team fall in love with your child. You know her needs or his needs if you have a boy and regardless of whether it's more time in the regular ed classroom or more services or therapies that they need or a different one-on-one -on -one assistant or more opportunities to communicate, uh, whatever it is she or he needs, those needs are more eagerly met when the team knows your child better. So how do you help them know your child better? One, one um, approach that we did all through high school, but particularly in those early elementary years, is we took snapshots of Ellie in her everyday life 
And some people take in big picture boards, some people take videos, any of those things, pictures, picture boards, videos. We like snapshots because I would physically hand them to the person next to me and say, isn't this sweet? This is Ellie with her cousins last 4th of July. And I see how they were all including her in their game. And then I would say, would you mind passing that around the table? Everyone's going to want to see her. Just presume they're going to fall in love with her and behave like, like, how can you not love her? She's perfect, right? So I passed the pictures around. Um, another thing that I did with all of the pictures, and even when I didn't have pictures to go with them, and that you need to do as well, please, is take anecdotes about your daughter. Any examples you have of she's in there, share them. Any examples that would cause a collective, oh, when you would tell someone, share those too. Um, what, what does she look like in her on moments? Any story that you would eagerly tell a good friend and that would make your good friend say, oh, you know, I just love your kids so much. That's so cool. Take those stories in with you to the IEP and just say, before we get started, I want to share this story and be absolutely unashamed about regaling them with story after story. Um, so, and not only doing this at an IEP meeting, but throughout the year, as you have, as you have inspiring moments to share or pictures to share, bring them in and show them to the teacher or show them to the para or whoever you can share them as they happen. Uh, the next thing that we brought to an IEP meeting uh, always was extra people. At Ellie's second or third kindergarten IEP, so you heard that right, I think we had five IEPs that year and several of them were contentious. But at maybe the second or third one, I felt outnumbered by a team of, of people who were on one side of the table and I felt like I was on the other. So I took an army. I took both sets of grandparents. I took two aunts, one uncle, and a neighbor who'd known Ellie since birth. And I let them all know they were coming, and we had to cram in. There was some standing room only. And I said, they're here because they love Ellie, and they just care about what's happening with her, and they want to be supportive. And and they their only job was to be quiet and look interested. I, and if I hadn't had them, I think I'd have gone to rent a friend and found people to go with me to say, I love this kid. So the last thing is, and it may sound crazy, take food. Donuts, cookies, cinnamon rolls, Rice Krispie treats, uh, bags of chips, whatever. I understand it's sometimes cost prohibitive, but if you can afford it, it's worth it. Do it. Uh, there was one time when we brought in a three foot long sub sandwich and sliced it into little pieces. Also, don't be offended if they don't eat it. Don't even worry about that. Encourage them and then just leave it there on the table when you leave. And maybe they'll eat it after you leave. I'm convinced that in kindergarten, first and second grade, they were probably scraping it into the trash and thinking I was trying to poison them. But by fourth grade, they were bringing their own napkins and tucking them into their shirt collars and saying, what are we having today? So uh, the next strategy is to just own the difficulty of Rett syndrome. Let them know you're here to help them, right? So Rett syndrome is hard. It's really hard sometimes and often, even for us as parents, just own it. It's the elephant in the room. And a new team, whether they're really accommodating and loving or whether they're really contentious and not, regardless of their personality, individually and as a team, they're still breaking a learning curve uh, on what it's going to be like to try and help include a child who can maybe not walk or talk or use her hands or his hands. Uh, so think about ways that you can support them. Always share your cell phone number um, with them and encourage them to use it. Let them know you want to help them as much as you can. Bring written notes uh, saying she had this kind of an evening or, or her allergies are making her a little tired or we had family in town last night. She lost a little sleep. Just little helpful hints. Give them tricks that you can use to help calm or excite your child. Um, let everything you do. You know, when Ellie was in really younger years, she liked a rhyme 
that we said, and we would say it sometimes till we were blue in the face, but I remember in preschool and in kindergarten teaching everyone that rhyme so that if she have, was having a meltdown, they could take her out of the room and, and say that rhyme until they brightened her up. <laughs> and, you know, if you can be a room parent, great. Uh, if you're a stay-at-home mom and you can do that, I would say it's a great to volunteer. If you, uh, if you, cannot do that, maybe you could volunteer to staple papers or do die cuts or any little thing the teacher needs. All of these things are the work of relationship building. You wanna help your daughter build relationships and it, the first building block of that is you building a relationship with the team. So what? here's a question I'm often asked right after this is what, what about when the teacher is just impossible to help or even to like, and it happens. You know, there are two things you can do. One is find, if the teacher has children, ask him or her to see pictures of their children and just forget yours for a little bit and be interested only in theirs. That's pretty irresistible to most people. Uh, another thing is if it's just not going to work, find a therapist, the para, an administrator, Administrator, another parent in the class, um, anyone on the team you can connect with. Um, and if no one on the team, then anyone in the classroom you can connect with. Uh, one thing is you can organize a play date, but I just want to throw this out so I don't forget to say it later. When you organize a play date with your son or daughter who has Rett syndrome and is nonverbal, invite two kids. Two kids work better than one kid. They have each other to talk to and you will help assist your daughter um, or son in whatever activity is planned. And then you can end up locking arms with that child and give that child strategies about how they can connect with your daughter in the classroom or your son. And that's, that's the first step in linking arms with that one other person. Okay, the next thing is parental concerns. So I cannot overstate the importance of the parental concerns portion of the IEP. Uh, you need to make a list of your concerns, an exhaustive list and an unambiguous list. And I, I, the importance of this really it can't be overstated. As far as I know, every IEP has a section for you to list your concerns, even if a section, if you can't find it or can't identify it, you can and should still submit your concerns to go into your child's file. So we brought our parental concerns to the meeting and we handed each person, physically handed them a hard copy, looks like this, okay? And then we gave the thumb drive so that the person who was taking notes could just boom, plug it into her computer and add it easily into the IEP without having to transcribe everything. And then we read them out loud, and this too is important. So I'm gonna take a minute now, and I'm gonna read these concerns to you. And before I do, I want you to know, you don't need to take notes. I'm gonna, I will provide you with a copy of these. But, this is, these are our concerns. You can copy any of them that are in line with your own concerns. You can edit them, modify them to fit your child's own unique needs, but please do not post them on social media. Do not post them on the internet, on Pinterest, nowhere on the internet. And I'll explain a little bit more about that after I read them, but here they go, okay. Those who interact, okay, and you can see here, right here, is what it says, concern to the parent and, or guardian for enhancing the education of the child. Here we go. Those who interact with Ellie will acquire and maintain knowledge and understanding of Rett syndrome and how it affects Ellie personally. Those who interact with Ellie will presume competence and challenge her academically. Those who interact with Ellie will appreciate that the key to learning for Ellie is to devise motivating activities that counteract the effects of apraxia. Those who interact with Ellie will allow sufficient time for her to break through her apraxia to respond to a request or make a choice. 
Ellie's individual education program will be consistently followed and implemented as evidenced by steady progress toward achievement of goals and objectives. Ellie will have her educational needs met and will receive a quality education. Ellie will consistently access the regular education curriculum through appropriate modifications, accommodations, adaptions, and co-implementation by IEP team members. Ellie's communication skills will be generalized across all environments. Parents will have regularly scheduled consultation with the IEP team members. The IEP team will promote and increase awareness by all who interact with Ellie of her intense desire to communicate and her unconventional methods of communicating, which may not be immediately obvious. The IEP team will improve the frequency and quality of Ellie's communication with others by promoting use and acceptance of multiple modes of communication, including, but not limited to, eye gaze, facial expressions, gestures, vocalizations, output, voice output devices, picture symbol systems, rather than any single system or approach. Those who interact with Ellie will realize that she understands far more than she can readily communicate. Those who interact with Ellie will maximize opportunities for her to make choices, enjoy social interactions, and communicate by whatever means are available to her. Ellie's efforts to respond, whether or not successful, will be acknowledged and praised by all who interact with her. Throughout the day, Ellie will interact with typically developing peers and develop friendships. Ellie will be welcomed and valued by her typically developing peers. Ellie will develop and maintain a strong sense of self-esteem. Through her inclusion in the regular education classroom environment, Ellie will learn about the world, develop an awareness and interest in it, and a sense of herself in the world. Ellie will be recognized and appreciated for making a contribution to the school community. Ellie will always have dedicated advocates and Ellie will feel loved and important every day of her life. So that's a long list. Your ears may have perked up a little when I read our concerns about friendships and interactions with typically developing peers. And you may also be asking yourself why it's a bad idea to post them on social media or on the internet. And the reason is this, when parents and administration or others on the IEP team disagree, it's very often because the parents are challenging a one size fits all approach that sometimes schools, it's because the path of least resistance is the easiest one to often take that's often the, the bone of contention between families and IEP teams. So IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, provides that each child's unique needs be met. If you can find a list of parental concerns on social media, so, so can others, so can administrators and teachers, and maybe even a challenging member of your team. And your parental concerns suddenly do not appear to be at all unique to your child. Um, it, they just look like they just found something off the internet and thought this sounded good. So use them, use them word for word if you like and share them as you wish, but just do so with sensitivity, just not on social media um, and modify, like I said before, modify or edit. Okay. So how to questions. I'm gonna end my discussion of parental concerns here with a suggestion that asking how questions, open-ended questions can provoke thought and they're asking these open-ended questions are more effective than simply asking for what you want and possibly getting a yes or no. So I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, this is for asking for a one-on-one. -on -one and this is a little less effective. Can we have a one-on-one -on -one for Ellie? So that, because someone needs to be constantly watching her. Can we have a one-on-one? -on -one? Well, the school might say, no, we really don't have anybody for that. And then, you know, it doesn't mean you can't still get one, but now 
you've just been given a no and, and it's sort of contentious. So tr what about this? You know, Ellie's apraxia often causes a real delay in her reaction to a question. It can even last for up to a minute. Her body language says she needs like, for example, her body language says she needs to use the restroom. It's a, just a quick wiggle and then it stops. And if it's not acknowledged, she gives up and then she's not learning how to use the restroom or go on her own. So how can we make sure Ellie's subtle attempts to communicate are never missed? What do you suggest? Then be quiet and let them figure out a way, you know, they, they have to answer. It's not a yes or no. Well, we can't figure out a way. Well, okay, then we'll figure that out as a team. Or what if we do that? They'll give you different ideas and then you can determine on the spot how that might work for your child. Um, another example is Ellie needs to spend more time with her friends. Can someone facilitate that? It's less effective than how can we help foster some friendships for Ellie? What are your ideas? And let it go from there. If a particular teacher, para, or therapist takes a shine to your son or daughter, capitalize on that by asking them if they would consider asking the students if the students have any ideas. Like we did that, you know, like ask them if they have any ideas about how to make Ellie part of the playground games or class activities. Kids are great advocates and they love to strategize about ways to include and so use them utilize them if you can so i think i want to just tell you now a really brief story you know what about when the iep doesn't work what happens um, are there other options for inclusion i have a dear friend and i was helping her advocate and her daughter emma they were looking for full inclusion. They wanted what Ellie had just, and so I thought, well, we can do this. And they don't live close to me. They live pretty, pretty remotely. Um, so I traveled to, to help them. And the school was resistant and we employed many of the strategies, all of the strategies I just said to you and many others. And in the end, the school met all of this mom's requests. But the one thing no one thought to touch on was homework. And because mom had ordered that, uh, or asked that Emma be very included and can do everything, the school inundated this young girl with a lot of homework. Not as a punishment, but they were like, hey, she can do it. So Emma was spending a ridiculous amount of time every night staying up to late hours trying to do homework which made it was the opposite of inclusion actually because she was so exhausted the next day she would often sleep the day away which there goes your inclusion so long story short is the stress that this mom and Emma experienced became totally overwhelming and even though she liked the school and she appreciated the inclusion and she emma had developed friends El, emma wasn't really experiencing inclusion the way mom hoped so what mom ended up doing was meeting someone who ran a homeschool co-op and it piqued her interest and it, a short time later mom made after really agonizing over the decision mom made the decision to allow her daughter to try homeschooling for a while in a co-op and all of the other kids in this homeschooling uh, co-op were typically developing kids well you know mom had some guilt over that but it's the most impressive story i've heard emma still went to school for she had a service plan rather than an IEP. She got several therapies there and she went for art class. So she maintained her connection to the friends she'd made in the regular school. She also had new friends that she made in this homeschooling co-op. Also, mom was having an epiphany. She was always good about helping Emma be included in different areas of life, but mom had this epiphany that you know what, I'm going to have to work extra hard to make sure she's included in other places. Well, Emma's sister is a dancer and dances on a team uh, and, and in a studio. So Emma actually liked that as well. Emma began dancing. Emma became really involved in her church and 
and that was another pot. She had different pots of friends. That's what I'm saying. Emma loved bowling. They tried to encourage her to go on the bowling team, but Emma said no. So they also gave Emma some control over what she chose to do. But she made all of these uh, new friends and really it was, it's one of the most impressive inclusion stories I've heard, right? She, my friend was determined to help her daughter be a part of the world and to participate in the, the sport of life and not simply be a spectator. So, and you can do this with your children too. That's what I want to tell you. You can do this. So I want everyone here to experience success. And I said that in the IEP teams regularly. I want you all to experience success, especially to Ellie's teacher. And as badly as I wanted Ellie to experience success, um, I understood that Ellie's para was a window to Ellie's success, that she is viewed as an extension of Ellie. And I know we can't choose a para, but it's been our experience that like this kind of a person makes for a good para. And so when we couldn't choose, because you can't choose the person, we made a list of qualities. Think about when you meet people with your son or daughter, who best interacts with them? If they need a quiet, calm personality, do they need a, someone who's willing to be like really animated and gregarious? Um, make an exhaustive list of the types, the traits that a person may have who would work well with your child. Uh, finally, what's this is something that came up more than once for us, especially when it was argued that Ellie did not belong in a classroom with other children who could learn. Ask the team, what is the ultimate goal in education? What does the whole, what's the point? of going to school and graduating from high school. And chances are they'll be quiet, but if they're not quiet, you give them a little nudge and say, the point of going to school is to prepare you for whatever comes after school, right? For some, it's going to college. For most, it's going to college. It might be uh, preparing for life in the workforce. It might be preparing for life in the military. For Ellie and for our children, it is preparing to live in the community. If you're not choosing to, to place your child into a home or into an institution, which some, that is the choice of some, um, the goal then is inclusion. That's the whole point. The people who she will be going to school with, Ellie's education equals making relationships because she needs to maintain relationships as she's out of the school system. That's what school looks like. And uh, two final thoughts, right? One is something that we've said, well, we always say presume competence. So do that with your children, presume competence. And we're uh, just one quick word about due process. The best way to avoid due process is to prepare for due process. When the school sends, um, writes letters about every single thing they do and takes notes on everything they do, they are preparing for due process. Not that they want it, but they understand that the best way to avoid it is to have a paper trail. Do that also, to write letters uh, when it's necessary, thank you notes. Um, I can talk to you more about that individually if you like. Um, last thing is to give someone Rett syndrome. In the early years, we went into Ellie's class to teach about who Ellie is. So this is Ellie, kids, and Ellie has something called Rett syndrome. And that means she was born not being able to walk or talk. And I had Ellie right up next to me and all the kids were sitting crisscross applesauce. And I gave them a chance to meet Ellie and I modeled. How do they interact with Ellie? I modeled it. Oh, Ellie, your eyes are telling me you are excited to be up in front of these kids today. Or, oh, Ellie, I see by your eyes, Oh my goodness, you must be nervous because you are looking down a lot or your body is shaking a little bit. Are you, are you, is that nervousness? What do you think kids and engage them and let them ask questions. 
Like, was she born that way? How does she walk? How does she get a drink? That's what littles ask. And you just tell them very happily and you model how to be a friend by showing them. In the older years, when Ellie was in middle school, um, there was, uh, we, we went into the classrooms and we said, we're going to give you Rett syndrome. And here's how you do this. And I've done this at a couple conferences, so forgive me if you've already heard this. So the way to do it is you stand up in front of the class and you say, okay, we're gonna give you all Rett syndrome, but I promise it won't last. It, you'll only have it for five minutes. You gotta follow all the rules. When I say three, you're gonna clap your hands together and you're not gonna take them apart. You're not gonna take your feet off the floor and you're not gonna say a word. You can make your eyes big or squinty or close them. You can make a yell if you want. Ooh! but you can't nod, you can't shake your head, you can smile, you can frown, that's it. So one, two, three, everybody has their hands together and then just let it be silent a, a few seconds, make it a little bit uncomfortable and then go up and ask each of the kids different yes or no questions. Um, hey, are, are you glad to be back at school? You know, right after summer and they look like this and you say, oh man, your eyes are saying no, you wish it was still summer break. And you answer for them, the yes or no questions. But then you get around to asking a question that's not yes or no. Like, hey, you like the movies? Hmm, your eyes are telling me yes, that's great. Well, what's your favorite movie? Okay, now they look confused. And you use that to say, I thought you liked movies. You're not saying anything. I Evidently, you didn't know what I was talking about in the first place. And you do that, with, and in the end, when you take Rett syndrome away, one, two, three, you're cured, and that's what we're praying for with our kids too, right? One, two, three, you're cured. When you take it away, you let them answer those questions, like, hey, you know, Mark, what's your favorite movie? And let Mark tell you what his favorite movie is and go back. It was particularly effective with one teacher, um, Miss Gus, who said, I am sorry, but this girl should not really be in my class. I can't remember how she said it, but it was something like that. And so I, when I gave the class Rett Syndrome, she played along, but I went up to the teacher and I said, you like teaching here? And her smile told me yes. And then I said, how long have you been teaching? And she didn't answer. And I said, where'd you get your degree? And she didn't answer. And I asked her a few more questions about teaching because she couldn't answer. And I finally said, I'm not sure you're qualified to teach my children or any children for that matter. You can't even talk or tell me where you got your degree. How do I know you're even smart or in there at all? And it really, it really broke Miss Gus open um, to understanding Ellie better. So that is all I have for you. Uh, at the end of this, I don't know if, uh, oh, thank you. There, Katie just advanced my slide. Remember that all of your emotions are contagious. So as best you can, go in uh, exuding joy and confidence and great hope and, uh, and, and hopefully the team will will rise to meet those those emotions. Um, and that's it. And I believe Ellie will or Katie will at the end of this give you uh, my email address and my phone number. And you may feel free to contact me if you have any questions at all or would like to chat about your IEP. Okay. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mickey. We appreciate that so much. So many valuable recommendations and strategies. And I think all the best learning points come from the true stories that you experienced with Ellie. And we're looking forward now to hearing from Katie Bush, who we are lucky to have with us, um, worked with Ellie as her para in the classroom. And Katie, if you could tell us a little bit more about who you are, who you've been in Ellie's life, what that's translated to for you now in the world of Rett syndrome, and then um, take us through some of your slides. We would, we are attentive and listening. Yes, thank you. I'd be happy to. So here's a couple pictures of Ellie and I. Um, and as Paige said, my name is Katie, and I was Ellie's one-on-one -on -one para starting in sixth grade and ending when I assisted Ellie across the high school graduation stage. 
I was by Ellie's side through the transition into middle school for three years of middle school and then into and through high school. The privilege to be Ellie's one-on-one -on -one was one of the most rewarding jobs of my life thus far. If you are a para, a case manager, or a teacher listening to this webinar that has not started your journey yet with your child who has Rett syndrome, know that there will be challenges However, the joy, the sense of purpose, and the rewards will outweigh those challenges. You will make a difference in at least one life, and chances are you'll touch and make a difference in multiple lives. So, yes, these pictures of, our, of me and Ellie. Um, the top right is me in the middle of the high school friends Ellie had in prom. <laughs> um, so yeah, you may be asked to do things that you never thought you would do again. <laughs> um, the bottom right hand is as, techn as technical as Ellie and I got. So Ellie was very low tech in her modifications. Um, we did eventually in high school move up to an iPad, which came in handy for a couple of things. Not only was it easier to tote around with us, um, but we were able to access school books online, so we didn't have to tote around textbooks, and we were able to keep up with social media, which made Ellie included. It was another way to keep her included. So just throwing that out there. Okay. The IEP. It can be a very large, daunting document, and you are asked to dissect it, understand it, and live it. It is your plan as a para or a teacher or a case manager. It's your plan of inclusion. But what is it telling you? If you were not part of the IEP meeting, which some paras are not, then you are going to have to do some digging. And I would suggest reaching out to the family. Ask them what their main goal is for their child. It should kind of wrap around the post-graduation information. And then you'll want to ask about the communication they use with their child. What does it look like? Get their thoughts, get their ideas. They are there to help you and they will help you. And don't be afraid to set up times outside of school to get to know the child and the family. Some school districts frown upon this but it really will help you. If you can get out there, see the, the child in their comfortable environment, see some of that modeling that Mickey mentioned earlier that the parents will do, and pick up on it. Learn about them. Learn what they enjoy. Learn what their room looks like. That's all part of having conversations with these children when they're in the school setting, when they come to see you you know, at, at school, hey, how was your weekend? Did you redecorate your room? Um, did you watch your favorite TV show? Those sort of things. It'll give you material. Open communication is key. And that's part of having that open communication. So whether or not you're able to share cell phone numbers, again, I know that's frowned upon in some school districts, so I highly recommend it. Um, if that's not where you all are at, then write notes in a daily journal back and forth from home to school and from school to home. You need that communication so you can have conversations and initiate responses from the child, the students, so you can start learning how they're communicating and learning their body language and their eye gaze. For Mickey and I, it did start with notes in a notebook that went back and forth from, from school to home and home to school. And it did give me that material so that my learning curve on how to read Ellie was short-lived. And Mickey would sometimes give me hints. You know, she'd be like, hey, ask Ellie if she got to see her cousins this weekend. 
And if she did, ask which one's her favorite. And then she'd give me the names because maybe I didn't know her cousin, you know, Connor, Brian, or Ethan. And I'm like, okay. And then Ellie would, you know, Ellie would eye gaze or show me what her fa- who her favorite was maybe. Or maybe she'd turn and laugh at me or roll her eyes. <laughs> but it gave me a clue as to Ellie's, deciphering Ellie's answers and how she was communicating. As time went on, though, and, you know, the seven years I spent with Ellie in the school setting, obviously the journal and the notebook went to the wayside, and it was text messages and phone calls. And Mickey and I even Snapchatted. You know, I would I would Snapchat Ellie with her friends or uh, maybe it was just Ellie and I. Um, and send that to Mickey. And then she'd have something that, hey, you know, when Ellie got home, hey, Ellie, you know, I saw this Snapchat. What in the world were you doing? <laughs> so um, that's how I suggest attacking that IEP and, and using that team to help you out. Modeling. So, again, Mickey touched on this earlier, and I'm going to expand on it just a little bit. Um, and it's a, it's a little different in the middle school, high school setting. And, and as the student grows older, um, obviously you, you still want to stay age appropriate. So maybe it's no longer age appropriate that mom comes in and um, demonstrates Rett syndrome and, and gives everybody Rett syndrome. Maybe it still is. Mickey was pretty cool, so I think she did it throughout most of Ellie's school career. (laughs) Um, But this is how you're going to teach others. You're going to, you're going to teach them by modeling to see what you see in your student or if you're the parent in your child. And this shows that they're in there. So parents, Point out how your child communicates. When you see it happening in live action, point it out. Don't be afraid to say, hey, did you see that? She just rolled her eyes at you. (laughs) Um, Paras and teachers, when you're in in a classroom setting or in the education setting and you see it, point it out. Point it out to the, to her, to her peers as well. Um, You know, when they start catching on, you can take a step back and you no longer have to be the voice in between. And that, that is a huge moment when a student comes up to me and says, Hey, um, I just saw Ellie do this. I don't think she, I don't think she's enjoying PE today, or I don't think she's feeling well, or she just laughed at a joke I made. That is, that's one of those rewards. That's a huge reward. And that means you've done your job. Ellie's included. And the community is learning how to accept her and to communicate with her. So it's, it's a big deal to model. Um, and know that kids are curious and they want to learn. They want to learn how to communicate. They want to learn about somebody who may look or act different than them. So help them understand that just because you may not get an immediate answer out of Ellie or one at all, doesn't mean that she doesn't understand and appreciate the interaction. There were plenty of times that, and and still are plenty of times that I say something to Ellie and I may not get anything back or I may have to wait a minute. And that's okay. So make sure that you're also helping those students and those peers and those teachers and other paras and anybody she runs into in the world that they give her enough time. And if she isn't able to answer that day for whatever reason, apraxia, um, not feeling well, tired, um, if she's not able to answer, say, hey, it's okay. We'll talk about it again later. Um, And encourage others to work with your student. So again, along that line of allowing her peers to learn how to communicate and the teachers to learn how to communicate with her, don't be afraid to step back and let them do schoolwork with her. 
again, there's nothing more rewarding than when I was able to step back and Ellie was able to take a quiz with a fellow student and ace it. And then that fellow student got to go, hey, she just aced the test I just gave her. I answered her or I read her answers correctly. I read her body language, her eye gaze. I did it with her. And so it's big for them, too, and it's big for the teachers. It connects the teachers with the student. Um, And many times, Ellie's close friends would point out to me if I'd missed something. And the best part was when I would, in math class, when I would give her two wrong answers or three wrong answers to choose from, and Ellie would turn to me, and she'd do one of two things, either start laughing at me or give me the stink eye. And then a fellow student who could see what I was doing would go, um, Miss Katie, you might want to try one of those being a correct answer. <laughs> so it's great. You know, when, when that opens up, even if you are the butt of the joke, <laughs> it's a reward. So don't be afraid of that. Um, now moving on to tough moments. There are going to be some, it's not always going to be easy. Um, you know, Mickey mentioned it's hard. It is hard. As a para, there were days, there were moments that it was it was difficult. Um, however, remember, your team has your back. You should be able to go to your case manager. You should be able to, if you've built these relationships with the teachers, go to the teacher and say, I need a break. Or this isn't working. Can we do something different? How can we approach this differently? Um, Rely on your team. You're not in it alone. Nobody is in it alone. Parents, case managers, teachers, paras, the students, other students, nobody's in it alone. Rely on each other. Um, You're going to have teachers who don't want your students in their class. Um, Most of this comes from fear. It's the fear of having more work for them to do, the fear of having to change how they may teach, the fear of not being able to understand the student. You can overcome this fear and you can help them. Um, you'll want to use that team. Bring somebody else in who who can read Ellie and who believes and let them join you. It may be a peer that's already in that class with you. It may be the case manager. But break them down by showing that this, that she's, she can do this. She or he can do this. Um, so referring back to Mrs. Gus, yeah, she was a difficult cookie. Um, Mickey definitely broke the ice with giving her Rett syndrome, but Ellie followed that up. I think it was a few months later. We were talking about some war. Um, Mrs. Gus taught history. And... She was talking about weaponry, and she, Mrs. Gus had a very dry sense of humor, and she shot off this sarcastic remark, and it was still early enough in the school year that the rest of the kids in the classroom didn't quite laugh at her jokes, like it wasn't there yet, and so she shot off this sarcastic remark, and without missing a beat, Ellie lets loose this gut-rolling laugh. Just, and and it continued. Like, it was a long, like, she just let it go. And Gus turned, and I turned and looked at Ellie, and then I turned and looked at Gus, and she turned at Ellie, and Gus started laughing. And in that moment, Gus learned that Ellie was in there. She was smart. And by relaxing a little bit and allowing Ellie to show her communication, in a natural way, Gus finally understood. And Mrs. Gus is still to this day a huge supporter of Ellie and will tell you point blank that, yeah, she, Ellie changed her and she believes. So it was, it was awesome. Um, So on that note, remember that these children with Rett syndrome are still just children. And they don't, just like typical children, they don't have to prove themselves every minute, every day, every week, or every year. Part of Rett syndrome is that apraxia. And if they feel pressured 
to do something, to achieve something, to get the test done, to hurry up and get something accomplished, they are going to struggle. They will possibly fail. So if you remember that your typical kids, they get restroom breaks during the classroom, during the hour. They can escape to the library if they're done being in those in, inside those four walls. They can go out and hang out with their friends in the hallway, and they do. So don't be afraid to allow that for your child who has Rett syndrome, your student who has Rett syndrome as well. Skip a class. It'll be okay. <laughs> um, you know, when you see that that they're not into it, there were plenty of times, oh, especially when we had substitute teachers, there were plenty of times that Ellie would look at me when we rolled into a class and there was a substitute teacher and she'd give me kind of a it's kind of a side eye with an eye roll and I'd go, okay, we're out. And we'd walk right out of that classroom <laughs> because Ellie was not, it just wasn't in her that day to, to deal with a substitute teacher or to watch a movie which most kids enjoy, but, um, or to read another chapter in the book. And that was okay. She didn't have to do it. You know, there were times that we were supposed to get testing done and she would fall asleep on me and I'd try to shake her awake and I'd stand her up and I'd get the stink eye. And I had to remember, wait a minute, she deserves a break too. She doesn't have to prove. She doesn't have to get all this done today. It'll be okay. We can modify this. We can shorten it. We can adjust to what she needs. So talking about modifying and adjusting to what she needs so that she doesn't feel that pressure, um, don't be afraid to lessen the work. You know, your, 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 her classmates may get a worksheet of 50 math problems. If Ellie makes it through 15, take it. Take it. Take your grade from that. Um, and don't be afraid then to also change to a different kind of platform. For Ellie, we changed to a pass-fail platform when she was in high school instead of straight grades um, because she then could have more time to access um, after-school clubs, um, dances, football games, baseball games. It gave her the chance to to spend less time doing homework and more time socializing and building that community, which is what she was going to need after graduation. Um, teachers, ask for modification help from paras. Paras, voice your thoughts and ideas. Don't be afraid to express an idea you have for modifications or to say, Ellie's not going to be able to get this done. It's too much. What can we do? Um, and I, I wish I had more time to talk you through the modification. Uh, I do believe we are running close on, oh, we're after one o'clock, running cl into the question and answer portion. So that'll be a different talk on another day. <laughs> um, you are a team. So I'm going to leave you with this this thought. You are a team. Nobody should feel alone in this. When there's difficult days, share them. When there are good days or when there are good moments, share them. Um, hopefully, you got, the team has built those relationships and can expand those relationships further into more peers, more teachers, um, the school staff, anybody you can reach, and work together to create that inclusive environment. Here's the contact information for Mickey and I. Feel free to contact either of us. And that's all I have for you today. Katie, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you drawing on your experiences with Ellie, sharing um, the things that allowed you to be strong and successful in your role within her life and within her school life. 
What I'd like to do now is we have a couple of questions that are in the queue. So if we can um, go ahead and just leave your slide up on the screen as it is so people can take down your contact information. We can also go back to previous slides if you need to. Um, let me do a check. Mickey, are you still with us? I am. Can you hear me? Sure can. Wonderful. And Katie, you're still with us? Yes, I am here. Awesome. Okay. Take a quick drink of water. You spoke a lot. You presented a lot. Let me go ahead and um, bring up, we've got uh, three questions in the queue right now, which I think gives us plenty of time to talk through. Each of you can um, riff off of each other with your answers. And for our audience and attendees, if you have any questions for Mickey or Katie or myself, please feel free to type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar panel and we'll, we'll get to them. Okay, so let me ask, the first question here is from an educator who's with us today who is, uh, has a child with Rett syndrome in their classroom for the first time having a student with Rett syndrome. And they're curious if you had any, I wish I had known this um, thoughts to share. Okay, that question is different from an educator than it is from a parent. Uh, so I, let me think about that for a second. Uh, the way I would answer that from a parent is I wish I had known the importance of having um, involvement that goes beyond school friends, um, that, that goes beyond having friends in the school system exactly. In other words, the value of, of having other pots of friends. Um, or I wish I had I wish I had looked more into the future. I would not talk with parents whose children were graduated because I was really actually pretty scared to death about what it would be like for Ellie when she graduated. Um, at school, I wish I would have, I wish I would have known, um, I guess I wish I would have known that how much the teachers wanted Ellie to succeed in those early years. Some didn't, but many did. And once I had it in my mind that they, that they were on the other side of the table, I had fear. So, and I wish I had known there were my Tobys available. Well, I guess I wish I hadn't known. I wish there had been back then. There weren't, and I think that's a great way. And I have just one that I can think of, um, and that would be, I wish I had known that, that there was going to be changes in, in Ellie. So one of the major hurdles that, that we came across, and we, I mean, the, the entire agency, including Ellie and her parents, was when Ellie developed seizures. That changed a lot. Um, it changed my role as a para, um, and I, I accepted that role. I gladly took it for Ellie, um, but I then had to become aware of what Ellie's seizures looked like and how that was going to affect her ability to do schoolwork. And in turn, the educator needed to know what that meant for LA schoolwork and environment and how to help LA through that because it was scary for LA too. So yeah, I wish, you, and that was just one of those changes. You know, we, we tackled uh, spinal fusion and foliosis and how that changed um, restrooming for Ellie and PE for Ellie. So yeah, just 
just know that there will be changes. So when you have something in place and you have the IEP plan in place, be prepared to let it change. Be prepared to let your modifications change. Be prepared to adjust to what Ellie's going to need, whether it's medically or it could be Ellie decides she doesn't like a class anymore. Um, so just keep it keep it fluid and and be okay with changes because they're going to happen. Yeah, thanks. Those are great. Um, so Katie and Mickey, I think when we have our lines open, we're getting audio feedback. I don't know if oh. you're hearing feedback or if it's just me. So maybe if you're not speaking, if you can put you yourself on mute and then let's see. I think that there we go. I'm not hearing the feedback anymore. So I hope our attendees aren't either. Um, I think that's a really important comment to attend to what I wish I had known about Rett syndrome. And I think this is relevant for parents, educators, paras, is that um, it's uh, Rett syndrome is a big paradox. You, the impairment, the medical issues, the apraxia, the movement disorder, the seizure disorder, constipation, nutrition, there's a lot to attend to and build into um, an IEP to make sure that every one of our children with this diagnosis are safe and their personal needs are uh, attended to in the school day. And then here we are talking about communication and layering and all of those things and learning and academics. And, and it can be a juggle um, to attend to all of that. But if you really understand the paradox of Rett syndrome, that somebody who can have all of those needs still has much higher um, receptive language skills than expressive language skills and to respect that. And respect that on any given day, any of those medical symptoms may get in the way of your plan for that day. So to be flexible, I think, is the um, biggest piece of advice that I would give you. I wish I had known to be more flexible and respect her needs on any given day. And understand that tomorrow she's probably going to show up and feel better and be more ready. And that's okay. Don't judge her for that. Just support her through what she needs. Um, it is a progressive disorder. And as Katie mentioned, she didn't expect to help a child through epilepsy, but she learned and she got over her fear and they worked through it and Katie was still able to go through school um, despite seizures and still be successful. So that would be my comment, my last comment. Um, Mickey, you're Thank nodding you. your head. Did you have something that you wanted to add to that? No, I was just, I was listening to you and agreeing and very much, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. If we don't have any more, we can come back to that. Let's go ahead to the next question in our queue, which is from an educator as well. And they are asking um, for some advice on how to have quality interactions, how to facilitate quality interactions between the typical general education peers and the child with Rett syndrome, the student with Rett syndrome. Uh, if you have any, if you can recall any practical um, activities or responses that really worked in Ellie's school life, they would appreciate hearing a few more stories. I know you gave some good examples, but I think examples always bring to life the advice. Yeah, uh, in the younger years, it's a little bit different than in the older years. So the first piece of advice is start helping kids interact with your daughter in the younger years so they are more comfortable as they move into middle school. Um, Ellie's friends did have uh, a pretty good uh, comfort level with that by middle school, but the whole, it, it can be summed up in one word and that's modeling. And I'm, I tried my best to model how to interact with Ellie and to, it, when kids were not interacting with her, like sometimes they were stand back and fearful, who's this kid in the, in the big chair who doesn't walk or talk and looking cautiously at Ellie. I acknowledge that in a really sweet way. 
and said, oh, Ellie, say hi, friend. Hi, how are you today? And then I would explain to this kid, you know, she talks with her eyes and then give a physical explanation. Think of baseball, like a color commentator. When you're listening to baseball on the radio, the, the color commentators help you actually see and feel, you know, the, the sun's in the sun's in um, his eyes out in center field and as he runs for the ball you can see him diving for the catch all of, it's the same with your daughter although people are looking at her her eyes are telling me she is really interested in what you're saying or she's looking down but she listens with her ears and so keep talking I'm so she loves that you're talking to her be her voice and encourage a teacher is has a powerful ability to foster friendships by being even in brief moments a teacher's busy with all she has many children in her class many students to whom she has to attend but even one little commentary on an interaction it's the equivalent of a, another kid coming home and saying the teacher called on me today and it was really cool or whatever uh, the para is in a particularly good position katie was amazing with fostering friendships and then as the kids get older uh, they tend to help each other and activities uh, as far as activities go i would just say think outside of the box um, we had a playground that was mulch I remember this, it was mulch. Ellie literally couldn't get in near the swing set at her school. We could have argued and we could have had them change that, but we chose to figure out a new way. And we had the kids come out when Ellie was in her early years and take turns walking around the playground or playing a game outside of the mulch and at first some teachers were resistant like no this is our playground area and we will play in here and so we very kindly suggested well here are our choices for ellie to be included with these kids we can either have the school pay to pave this playground area so that ellie's wheelchair can go in there and that would be really expensive or we can come up with ways for the kids to come out here and take turns coming in or even have an adult get her out of her chair and have the figure out ways that the kids can help. It's thinking outside of the box on that. Great suggestion, thank you. We've got two more questions in the queue. Um, before we move to those, Katie, did you have an activity yeah. or? Mm -hmm. Just real quick, so one of the accommodations that Ellie had was called a step-by-step, -step, a button. A button. And we used that button and it never failed even in high school. Um, when I pulled that button out and I would record a message on there, um, you know, Ellie, Ellie actually took speech class in high school and we recorded speeches and would give them and it never failed. The first time we would pull it out in a classroom and Ellie would hit the button and my voice would play and somebody would always pipe up and go, oh, is that Ellie's voice? <laughs> and so we'd all have a nice laugh because somebody would catch on and be like, oh, come on. And I would say no, but, you know, it's my voice. And then it opened the discussion for, does anybody want to record something on here for Ellie? Because they always liked hearing their own voices on the step by step. And it came in particularly handy when Ellie took a theater class. And there were a couple of boys in that class who loved to record something for that class. You know, if we were playing a game, they would record Ellie's part. And then when Ellie hit the button and it was a man's voice coming out of the step-by-step, -step, everybody just thought that was hilarious. So um, those come in handy for breaking the ice and getting kids involved with her communication. Um, the other thing I thought of was, this was before my time as Ellie's para, but I heard many, many stories of it, but Ellie went on fifth grade camp. And at that point, her 
class was embracing her wholeheartedly. And one of the things they would say was Ellie does the same thing we do. She just does it differently. So approaching it at that, you know, Ellie, if, if you are trying to kick up communicate communication or fostering friendships between typical peers and your student with Rett syndrome, let them know. She just does it differently. How can we, how can we do this so that she can do it too? And teach them and let them figure it out with you. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Great advice. Um, and that, you know what, that worked really well with Katie. When other peers started doing her step-by-step -step talker, I got much better messages from her when she came home from school. So as a parent, Katie, thank you for sharing that tip. Um, okay, let's move to the next question in the queue. This is a very good one. And it's from a parent who's um, sharing with us that she's asked multiple times for the para to be part of the IEP meetings. And the school seems to always have a reason not to allow her Usually the excuse, um, the just the reason is that they don't have a sub para to cover the child with Rett syndrome in the classroom or to cover her, the para's responsibilities in the classroom during the IEP meeting. Is that allowed? Do you have any suggestions of how um, the parent can help the para be part of the education, uh, the IEP meeting? Yeah, so, so we experienced that as well. And they simply said they did not have a sub so this was difficult. We had to battle about it. Again, this is a pick your battles thing. We just really wanted her there. If you have any sitter, anyone who will stay with your daughter at home, it's worth her if she's in her younger years and not able to attend her own IEPs yet. It is worth it. It was worth it for us, I should say. It was worth it for us. We left Ellie at home uh, with a caregiver and we said we are doing this because it's that important to us that the para be a part of the IEP uh, meeting. And we also worded it once again like it wasn't it wasn't just important to us, right? It wasn't just for Ellie. I mean, really, that's what we really cared about. It was for Ellie. She needed a para who heard what was going on in this meeting and understood. But what we said was, it will. we want the school to be successful. And the more the para understands, the more the para can take the burden off the teacher and the others who work with Ellie because the para will is with her every day she can hear what goes on and we value her input and we would like to invite her and once I don't know if that meant something special but as soon as we said we want to invite her and we had caregiving they kind of slumped their shoulders well after the first time that we had our para this was before Katie the para at that time come, the IEP team did see a value in it because she understood what was being asked of her and she had less questions about the goals and objectives and how they might be implemented. She was privy to that. So that's one approach. Um, and the other is we'd really like to invite her. Who else, you know, like, if we would have had to, if they, if we hadn't had caregiving for Ellie, I would have said it's not important to me that, for example, the OT, who spent very little time with Ellie, I would have said, can the OT spend time while she's in the meeting? That'll be Ellie's OT time. Or can we schedule it around some other time yeah. that someone else would be with Ellie, I mean? That's great. And I think, Nikki, you, um, you said something very important, which is when you expressed that you wanted to invite the para, that is a right that you have to have people in the room present for the IEP that you deem necessary. So um, follow up on that as a right. And also remember that your child's IEP is probably going to occur at the same time of year, every year. Um, all of the work going into her IEP 
hopefully will be happening in advance. You're already having conversations with the teacher and the therapists and coming up with goals. And the IEP is when you're there to get team consensus and the paras working with your child are part of the team. Um, but it shouldn't be a surprise that every April is gonna be your child's time for her IEP or every October. So with enough planning in advance, just make sure that the team knows that you wish to invite the para and that you're doing it with enough time and notice that they don't have an excuse to arrange that IEP meeting um, to be before school, during break time, after school, or um, following any of the recommendations that Nikki shared. Okay, um, we have a few more minutes and we've had another question in the queue. I'm gonna go ahead and read that this one out loud. This is from um, an educator who is seeking advice for helping um, others in the school environment understand that um, girls with Rett syndrome have so much to offer in the way of relationships. She's been working um, as this child's special educator for two years now, and she's having to really face concerns from others at the school. Um, Oops, I just clicked off the question, sorry. Okay, that, so what she's facing is that her, her colleagues at the school are feeling that as the children are aging, that the child with Rett syndrome isn't benefiting as much from the peer interaction and should be spending more time in a classroom with other children using assistive communication devices. And the special educator um, just feels strongly that the general ed inclusive environment is really important for this child, but is just seeking a little bit more advice for, for how she can um, facilitate that amongst her colleagues, that shared belief. Well, <clears throat> it's even more important as, uh, for it was even more important for us as Ellie got older, because uh, I'll refer back to what I was saying about what's the point of graduation. She, the importance of her connecting with her typically developing peers who will live around her and, and in her own community um, are, is this child's, it was our child's goal, and it's this child's goal. And the truth of the matter is that's just, uh, think of a nice way to say it. It's a lack of understanding completely about what, how Rett syndrome presents itself as, um, as the children who have this disease, this disorder progress, right, um, and age. So Ellie actually, as she lost her abilities to move easily and engage in a more animated way, so you couldn't readily see what was in there, but her brain was even more engaged than before because she didn't have the distractions of her body uh, doing things she didn't necessarily want it to do. Uh, her mobility had decreased. Her um, ability to express herself has decreased. Her awareness had increased. And what you see is not necessarily what you get. Uh, so there's a certain amount of faith that has to be done. If you don't take someone who's had um, a traumatic brain injury and can no longer express themselves and say, well, it's best if they just be with other people. You need friendships more than ever. And I would just say what what would be more important if we're if she is in a classroom or with a therapist who's simply working on communication skills to communicate with whom if they don't get to know her and they can't be around her and her skills are decreasing to actually use the the Toby or whatever it is she's communicating with what what's the point who would she be communicating with so the argument is. This is the way Rett syndrome presents itself. Friendships are the key. Relationships. My thought. Yeah. Thank you, Mickey. Um, I hope that um, that really provides some good information for that parent. We've got another uh, last question in the queue, and then we'll wrap up for today. And as Mickey and Katie have offered, they are open for 
continuing dialogue and conversation after today's webcast, and I am always available as well. But I think this is a this is a good question. Um, a parent is asking how how what kind of suggestions can they make to expose educators who haven't had an inclusive environment at their school um, see possibilities. So if the school that the child's at is really just ingrained in having separate environments for the kids with additional or different needs, um, and she herself isn't feeling confident in being able to go in and model, what kind of things could they do? She's already suggested that perhaps they visit another local school where a child with significant needs is participating in general ed so that they can observe and model. And the school hasn't followed up on that. Um, so, yeah. yeah, so beyond sharing the link to this webcast with the team, yes. um, which is right. a good start, do you have any closing, closing thoughts to bring it all home? When, when it was so difficult, this is exactly what we faced in the early years with Ellie. And one thing that I did was uh, I took an inspiring story. So an anecdote that wasn't about Ellie, but it I remember crying when I heard it, two of them actually, and I won't give you the whole thing, but I can sum up. One was a mom, Jocelyn Curtin was the daughter's name and Marlon Curtin was mom's name. and Marlon was talking about what inclusion looked like for Jocelyn. And it was before even I understood how much Ellie could be included. And I shared that story as much as I can, as I could. And it, the, you couldn't hear the story about Jocelyn without being moved to tears. Um, and the other story that I shared was about a music therapist um, who had connected with all these girls with Rett syndrome and then left town without thinking about explaining that she was leaving town. And when she came back, they all gave her the cold shoulder. And it was her aha moment of how much these girls rely on relationship and communication. And it, it again, another moving story. So find, connect with parents who have inspiring stories and tell them with passion. Uh, about the meaning of inclusion and what this means. And again, not, not to belabor the point, but the best way to do it is to say, what's the point of this education? It's to prepare my daughter or son for the next step. And the next step for them after school is to be connected with people. And if the people that they're growing up with don't know how to connect with them now, they won't automatically know how to do it after they graduated from graduate from high school. And, that, and remember that this isn't to work in there, that this isn't just about what your daughter needs. Your daughter has so much to offer. She's, she's changing lives. She should have the chance to help the other students in the school um, have a richer, deeper understanding of what it means uh, to truly include and love without boundaries, not just people who are just like us and can do just what we can do. So she has, she has lessons to teach. So she, these are different inspiring little things you can say maybe. I can help you too if you wanna call. Great, thank you, Mickey, I think that's wonderful go back to what is the point of the education, preparing for lifelong inclusion, and that the relationships are reciprocal. Not only does the child with Rett syndrome need these inclusive relationships, but all of the students on campus are gonna benefit from knowing your child. And that's really powerful. Um, she, she can be a teacher as well. And Paige, can I just add one, one other thing? And this was something mm -hmm. that up again and again, um, there's no way that Ellie could ever prove that she is in there or isn't in there. There's no way. She can't say it. So we have to just believe something. We have to. So we, on which side, which side do you want to err? Do you want to presume incompetence 
and err and and ruin the lives of your child, uh, you know, this student and many others by saying, well, she's incompetent anyway, we need to remove her? Or do you want to err on the side of competence where the only the only thing that you're getting, even if the daughter understands nothing, is love and, and inclusion. So pick your side. That's it. Great advice. That's that's powerful. That's an open-ended question for the room in the IEP. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I know that we could um, continue to talk and uh, Mickey and Katie, I hope we can invite you back for future webcasts on different topics. You have so much to share from your um, your partner's training and all of your years of experience and your strength and involvement with the REC community. So thank you for your time today. Uh, we are out of time, so I do um, want to share a few, there we go, I'm gonna take over. So I do want to um, share a few quick items of information while we're still together. There we go, okay. Um, so Katie and Mickey, thank you. We will invite you back and thank you for making yourselves available to our audience. We appreciate all of the information you shared with us. And I can say for me personally, as well as for all of our attendees today, you have given us all so much hope and inspiration to do the necessary hard work on behalf of our children who have a challenge advocating for themselves. Um, to all of our attendees, families, the educators, professionals who joined us today, we hope you found value in today's session and that the knowledge that you heard and learned today will help empower you in ways great and small as you continue your path forward, finishing up the school year this year, moving into extended summer um, sessions and into your plans for next year. We wish you the best of success. And, uh, Rett syndrome is a complex disorder. We're making exceptional progress. My request to everybody, um, but especially to families, is that you continue to try your best to understand how to advocate, advocate for your um, child and that your efforts will become the precedent for all future children. So be empowered to know that what you do is not only gonna help your child, it will help all the children who are coming um, up the path behind you. Understand that there are laws and precedents to support your efforts. And um, you can reference back to past webcasts to learn some of that information. And of course, there are always advocates in your own community who can come be your, by your side if you feel like you need a change, but you're not quite sure how to get there. And Mickey has offered her um, herself to you. Uh, I'm not sure what her rates are. I'm pretty sure they're they're free of charge and maybe a good Subway sandwich. We continue, <laughs> um, we will continue to bring you uh, information like this, lessons learned from those who have come before us so that we can continue to build and improve upon all of our ch children's chances for um, success and best in development, both on the online, uh, in online webcasts such as this and in in-person RET Education Days. We have quite a few coming up this spring and summer. Um, this Saturday, in fact, Mickey and Katie will be um, at the St. Louis Symposium on Friday, April 12th. Information about these Education Days are on our website and you can look there for uh, dates, times, location, registration information. Um, in closing though, I always have to come back to research. So um, pivoting off of the idea of making progress um, with our individual children, we, we always have to discuss the value of publications and evidence and research to support the vision for our children, whether it's through education, communication, quality of life issues, treatments, symptom management, and ultimately the pursuit of a cure. We need everybody to engage in research. And so what I wanna ask is that as we um, move through time, if you hear messages from redsyndrome.org asking you to complete questionnaires, to enroll in the natural history study, to consider participating in clinical trial, please consider it. Um, it really is the path for us to have evidence-based information to improve the lives of all of our children. 
And if it seems difficult or out of reach for you to decide to participate, just contact us and we'll help you talk through that decision tree. We are at a time when true research participation is not only a reality, it's as critical as fundraising. So we ask that you remember us with your fundraising efforts, that you respond when we ask you to engage with research opportunities, and that you continue to avail yourself and empower yourself through these webinars, these education days, to make you the best advocate you can be with your child. We believe that information on our disorder should be free to all who avail themselves of it, and we thank our supporters for that shared belief. These webinars allow us to direct all um, as many precious dollars as we can towards funding the research that helps you. So it's, uh, it's a great feedback loop for us to stay connected as a community and involved. Our children are worth every effort. So to complement um, the recorded sessions that we offer every month that are free, we encourage you to uh, attend the Ed Days, and we encourage you to um, look at our schedule of upcoming the Eds, particularly next month will be a Saturday session. Um, it won't be our usual second Tuesday of the month. It will be Saturday, May 11th. The topic will be adulthood, living, and lifestyle options. We have an extensive panel of professionals and parent advocates who are going to talk about this really important stage of life, and we hope you join us. The link to sign up is on our website at rettsyndrome.org forward slash ed. And until we speak again, please be well, try hard, and know that we care deeply about you and your family. Thank you for being with us, and have a good afternoon.